Welcome to our Europe in the World seminar on behalf of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies. I am Vasilis Kutiparis, and we are particularly excited today that we are uh, honored to host Professor Bradford, one of our uh, graduates from the law school at Harvard, and Professor Royal, who is the chair of the Europe in the World seminar, uh, for a discussion on uh, Professor Bradford's book, uh, The Brussels Effect. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Be safe. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Professor Roya. Thank you very much, Basilis. And thank you, all of you, for joining us from all over the world. It is true that um, it is sad not to be able to get together on campus in person. But I have to admit that it is also a great opportunity to see that so many people have been able to join us from all, literally all over the world. So thank you and, and welcome to the first meeting of the um, Europe in the World Seminar. I'm Sebastian Royo, like Vasily says, I'm a professor at Suffolk University. And today we have with us um, Professor Anu Bradford. Um, she is the Henry Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School. And she is a leading scholar on the European Union regulatory power and a very sought-after commentator on the European Union and Brexit. She is also an expert on international trade law and antitrust law. And like Basilis mentioned, she's also a Harvard University alum. She got both her SGD and LLM from the Harvard Law School. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you back, even if it's remotely, Anu. Um, she um, has just published um, a book that has been extraordinarily uh, well received. Um, it's called The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, have it with me. And this is really um, a very important book. It has received extraordinary reviews, including one in Foreign Affairs from Andy Morapsik, um, who claimed that this, and I'm quoting, that this might well be the single most important book on Europe's global influence to appear in a decade. So it is for us a, a great pleasure to welcome Professor Bradford. She's gonna speak for about 20 minutes and then we will open to questions and answers. Um, in order to ask questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the page. And I will be moderating the discussion and raising the questions to Professor Bradford to make sure that we get as many as we can. So without any further ado, Professor Bradford, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you everyone for joining. So let me delve right in and maybe start with the question of why I wrote the book. So this book is my attempt to correct a discourse that I think is misinformed or at least incomplete. There is a common perception that Europe today is a declining and increasingly irrelevant power in the world that uh, it belongs to history, its best days are over, and it has very little ability to influence the course of the affairs today. Because this narrative very much contradicts with the European Union that, that I observe every day in my teaching and research. And uh, this book is my attempt to write up that narrative that I believe more accurately captures the European Union's place in the world. So if we think about some examples of the influence that the European Union has across the global marketplace, let me start with some very well-known American companies in the digital economy. So if you think about firms like Google or Microsoft or Apple or Facebook, these companies follow the European Union's privacy policy, the data protection regulation, the GDPR, not only with respect to their dealings with European internet users, but across the world. If we take, for instance, then uh, Twitter, or we take YouTube, or again, Facebook, these companies also follow the European definition of what constitutes hate speech when they determine what kind of speech they remove from their platforms. They use that and not the First Amendment of the American Constitution. And it is not just the American companies and digital economy that are shaped by European regulatory standards. The European law also determines how timber is harvested in Indonesia, what kind of pesticides um, 
uh, African farmers use in their cocoa farms? What kind of chemicals Japanese toy manufacturers uh, deploy in their chemicals? What kind of equipment Chinese uh, dairy factories install in those factories? Um, what kind of uh, uh, or how much privacy we afford to internet users uh, in Latin America? The list could go uh, on and on. The interesting thing is that we see these examples of the European law shaping critical economic outcomes across different industries and different types of companies around the world. So this is basically, by way of examples, what I capture by the term, the Brussels effect. The Brussels effect refers to the European Union's unilateral ability to regulate the global marketplace. The EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So these companies follow the European regulations, but not only with respect to the trade that they do in the EU, but often they extend those European standards across their global conduct and production in an effort to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So by choosing to follow the most stringent law, which often is the European law, these companies are able to choose a uniform single standard and have access to markets uh, around the world. So that is what the Brussels effect captures. So one obvious question is why do we see the Brussels effect and not for instance, the Washington effect or the Beijing effect? The European Union is certainly not the only large economy in the world. And the market size is an important foundation for the Brussels effect. If you were, say, Costa Rica, and you decided that you wanted to become the global regulator of the environment, what would the global companies do? They would just decide to carve out Costa Rica and not trade on that market. But they cannot afford to do that in Europe. But that still begs the question, why not Washington effect? Why not Beijing effect? And the argument in the book is that the market size is necessary, but alone that is not sufficient. You also need to have the regulatory capacity, the legal institutions that allow you to unleash the power of that large market and convert it into tangible regulatory influence. So the European Union has that kind of bureaucratic capacity, the legal infrastructure in its institutions in the EU. China, not so much. China is busy building that kind of regulatory capacity, but it is still a long way away from being able to generate and enforce the kind of rules that the Brussels is doing. The US on the other hand, there is plenty of regulatory capacity in Washington DC. The difference is that the US has made a political choice to primarily let that regulatory capacity sit idle there is very little political will to deploy it. So since about 1990s, early 1990s, the US has taken a backseat as the global regulator. Up until then, a lot of the global standards did emanate from the United States. But then the US has pursued a very conscious policy of deregulation. And at the same time, the EU has been pushing forward, building the internal market and what has been the tool to build that in, in, uh, internal market? It has been regulation. So the EU has the market size, it has the regulatory capacity, but it also has the political will to deploy that regulatory capacity. So that is just a, 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 a some of the, at least the beginning of a, a short version of the theory of why the Brussels and why the European Union today is the only uh, global regulatory power. Um, so what this uh, book also invites us to do, it invites the conversation of what power means, what influence consists of, and um, how we should think about relevance in the global marketplace. And in many ways, what I argue is that this book shows that regulatory power actually matters. It is often more deployable, it is much less costly, and it's very difficult to undermine 
by others. So there's a certain resilience that is embedded in the regulatory power. So military power, hard power, is very costly to deploy. The power measured through, for instance, economic sanctions is also often very costly for the country inflicting them. If you think about uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty of undermining the Brussels effect, think, for instance, how the President Trump can walk away from Paris Accord. He can turn his back to international trade deals, but he cannot do anything to constrain the Brussels effect because all the EU needs to do is to regulate its internal market. It is then the global companies that voluntarily choose to follow the EU rules and translate and transform and transpose those EU rules across the global marketplace. There's nothing President Trump can do to tell companies such as Facebook not to follow the European rules. There's nothing the current administration can do if an American company decides to avoid the kind of chemicals that the EU does not allow to be in the products that are exported into the EU market. So in many ways, it is a market-based power where the EU does not really need to do more than to regulate its global market. It doesn't need to impose anything, nor is it dependent on the willingness of the foreign, co uh, foreign governments to emulate its rules or to agree to cooperate with the EU's regulatory approach. So let me now turn to uh, the, um, the two uh, big questions that I address in the end. Let me first say that we can talk about the different case studies. I, I talk about competition law known as antitrust in the US. I talk about digital economy, um, consumer uh, health and safety, so chemical regulation, food safety, or environmental regulation. I'm happy to talk about any of those examples. But in my introductory remark, maybe I turn to the last two chapters of the book. One asking whether this is a good thing, whether we should be celebrating the Brussels effect or whether it is a cause for concern. So, and then the last chapter will ask whether the Brussels effect will last, what is its future? future. So on the normative question on the desirability of the Brussels effect. So first of all, let me emphasize that the book is primarily, its contribution is descriptive. It explains why and how the European Union has acquired this power and how it transforms the global marketplace without taking a stand or whether this is good or not. But there is a chapter where I do engage with the criticism leveled against the Brussels effect. So let's, let's talk about those uh, potential uh, reasons for concern. And the first reason is that there are many critics who have said that, look, regulation is costly, it, it uh, hampers innovation, and if the Brussels effect magnifies uh, the, 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 it's the, the European regulation and replicates them across the global uh, marketplace, we will see also those costs being magnified. We see less innovation taking place across the world. And here, I would concede that I think it is a very legitimate question to be asked. I remember talking to one uh, uh, tech executive and I asked him, what is the difference between European and American regulators? And he told me, look, what the Europeans want is that they want us to satisfy a consumer need. And what the Americans want us to do, they want us to change the world or allow the world to be changed. And obviously, if every company around the world only regulated towards satisfying the consumer need, there may be some disruptive innovations that are beneficial to the humanity that will never see take place. But at the same time, I think it's too quick to conclude that every time regulation means less innovation or more costlier products. There are plenty of examples of, uh, for instance, um, environmental efficiency technologies, which are good for the environment, but also make products cheaper and costlier and, uh, and are, are great innovations that benefit and take the society uh, uh, forward. There's also a wonderful uh, book by a French economist at NYU called uh, Thomas Philippon, and he wrote this book called The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. And he shows how the luck of antitrust regulation in the United States has led to excessively concentrated markets, higher profits for the companies, and much higher prices for the consumers. 
and the rigorous regulation of competition in the EU has lowered consumer prices significantly. That is the reason why I pay so much less for my flight from Paris to Madrid than I pay for my flight from New York to Chicago. That is the reason why my cell phone plans are so expensive in the United States and so much cheaper in Europe. So regulation can, but does not have to, lead to costlier products and less innovation. Let me now move to the second criticism leveled against the Brussels effect. And that is one of protectionism. The idea that the European Union is engaging in this regulatory zealous behavior in an effort to level the playing field and give a leg up to the European companies that otherwise cannot compete with the more innovative American counterparts. So this is something that has especially been raised in the context of the EU's repetitive antitrust suits against uh, American companies. Three landmark uh, cases against Google with very high fines. But if you look at these cases, there is no European search engine on the other side that the EU is trying to protect. If the EU wants to regulate Facebook, there is no European social media giant that would be getting a competitive advantage. Often these are American companies on both sides of the disputes. If you think about who brought the complaint against Google to the European Commission, it was Microsoft. Um, if you think about the massive fine against Intel, who was the main beneficiary? Another American company, AMD. So protectionism as a fundamental logic driving the European regulation, I think is misplaced as an allegation. So let me address the, the final criticism that I discuss in the book, and that is one of regulatory imperialism. This idea that the European Union is trying to impose its standards and preferences on the rest of the world, compromising the democratic prerogatives of foreign uh, governments and the ability to basically regulate the economies and uh, the markets and, and preserve the, the political autonomy of their citizens. And I think it is right that often because of the Brussels effect, the European consumers' preferences do get entrenched around the global marketplace. Um, and there are uh, definitely stakeholders around the world who don't like that, who would not want to, for instance, necessarily uh, um, have as environmental products if in that instance, there was a trade-off that the less safe or less environmental product was uh, more affordable. But the main defense that the European Union can invoke is one uh, of its sovereign right to regulate its own market. The EU is not imposing these standards on any foreign company, on any foreign government, to the extent these companies don't operate in the European Union market. And that is something that you cannot tell that the EU could not do. It has the right to protect its citizens, it has the right to protect its consumers, and it has the right to pursue the policies that serve Europe well. And it is then the choice of a global company to follow the European rules in the other markets as well. That is their choice, not a choice that the European Union will impose on them. There's also another response to the criticism that I think may be quite controversial, but let me share that regardless. And that is this idea that often the foreign companies uh, may actually be becoming the advocates of EU regulations uh, abroad. Foreign consumers may be welcoming them as a way to offset the democratic and regulatory deficiencies of their own governments. So if we think about some foreign governments not either being able to or willing to regulate, for instance, many share the view that the regulatory process in the US is very much compromised because of the massive influence that money has on, through lobbying on regulatory outcomes. And maybe the status quo of, for instance, the chemical regulation, food safety regulation, the regulation of privacy does not fully reflect the democratic preferences of American citizens that would be undistorted by the amount of money in, in the politics. So there are some who have said that actually, if anything, the European Union is like a global benevolent hegemon whose regulatory impact, the external one, offsets some of the regulatory deficiencies abroad. 
Let me now close with the, the remarks on the future of the Brussels effect. And it's also something that can be a longer conversation that we can continue in the Q&A. But shortly, I, I focus both on external and internal threats to the Brussels effect. And let me just now, in the interest of time, only discuss two of them. One is the external threat and the rise of China. And the question of whether the Beijing effect will be taking over the Brussels effect sometime soon. And there, I think it is an absolutely inevitable fact that the relative size of the European market will go down. The relative importance of the European economy as measured by the proportion of the EU's GDP of the global GDP will go down. The EU will be a less important market in the future. And the market size, the market power is the foundation of the Brussels effect. But at the same time, the argument that I make in the book is that the EU's regulatory power will outlive its power measured by the GDP alone. And I say that for the following reason. There will not be a Beijing effect replacing the Brussels effect anytime soon because the GDP is not as good of a predictor of the country's propensity to regulate compared to the GDP per capita. It will be a while before Chinese are able to afford to care about the quality of the environment and the importance of the fundamental right to privacy, about the, the, the importance of the food safety, chemical safety, you name it. They will need to have much wealthier consumers, the much higher GDP per capita before those preferences start prevailing. But by the time the Chinese consumers are so wealthy, most likely the overall growth in the GDP has slowed down to the level that the Chinese government might be hesitant to impose any regulations that may further dampen that growth. So that's the, the, the argument that I, I will use to argue that the Brussels effect might actually last longer than we immediately would think. In terms of the internal criticism and, and threats, we can talk about the rising anti-EU uh, sentiment. There I argue that uh, it is an absolutely serious threat in the EU, but it's less targeted at the regulatory power. If you think about the, the, uh, the governments uh, uh, in, in countries like Hungary and Poland, they don't really worry about the EU going after big tech companies with antitrust. They don't really question as much the food safety, chemical safety, and so forth. They worry to be able to control their judiciary, their press, the migration, and the issues that are not at the heart of the regulatory state in the EU. And let me close then with Brexit. So which I guess now still be considered an internal challenge, which will become potentially an external challenge uh, next. But um, there are many who would at first uh, seem to suggest that the Brexit will undermine the Brussels effect. The EU will lose a big chunk of market share. It will lose a lot of regulatory capacity. But the book actually argues that more than the Brexit is able to undermine the Brussels effect, the Brussels effect will directly undermine Brexit. So if you think about the importance of the EU market for the UK economy, it is the destination to about 50% of UK exports. It is the number one destination for industries such as airspace. Um, if we think about automobiles, the chemical industry, pharmaceuticals, um, financial uh, services, these industries will continue to need the access to the European market long after departing the European Union. The question then becomes, if you are a British automobile manufacturer, do you want to follow the EU standard that applies to the market that is six times the size of your domestic market? Or do you really want to set up a second production line and start producing also to a different UK specific standard? It is not in your interest. So there will not be such thing as regulatory sovereignty awaiting the UK on the other side of Brexit. Um, that was a false promise of the Brexit campaign. We will not see the UK unleash itself from the EU's regulatory realm. If anything, what we will see is that the UK companies will be living potentially in ever more tightly regulated Europe because the UK has chosen to become a rule taker as opposed to rule maker, which means that the UK will have no say over the future of those regulations and that important 
skeptical voice when it comes to regulation, the pro-market voice is not around the table when those future regulations are being discussed. And pro-regulation countries such as France and Germany are gaining more ground. So let me just end with those remarks and hand it over to you, um, Sebastian, and I welcome all and any uh, questions and anything that I said or failed to say. Thank you very much, Anu, for those um, very interesting uh, remarks about your book. I want to remind everyone, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Um, I will be moderating the discussion and passing along your questions to Professor Bradford. Have uh, to start the discussion, um, a couple of um, questions about your book. I mean, the first one, when you, you mentioned in, both in the book and in your presentation, the general data protection regulation and how it's setting global standards for privacy and also for data governance. Uh, one of the interesting examples that you mentioned in the book is the case of Apple that um, decided not just to follow the rules within the European Union, as you mentioned at the price of operating in the European Union, but then they also decided uh, to adopt those principles globally. I found that it was an interesting way in which, um, to the point that you raised, it's not just affecting the internal market, but also um, becoming more generalized around the world. And all the governments have also adopted the GDPR model because, again, they want to have access to, to the European market. Um, however, one of the criticisms, and you do make um, a, a reference to it in, the, in your remark, has been that it tends to be heavy-handed and bureaucratic, and also that it tends to benefit the larger companies at the expense of the smaller ones, companies like Google, like Google that have the money and the capacity to comply, um, but smaller companies have much, much harder difficulties complying with this regulation. What do you make of this criticism and how do you think that the European Union should address it? So Sebastian, I'm glad you raised this because I think it is probably the biggest weakness of the GDPR. I think it's a criticism that is accurate, it's unfortunate, and the regulation has had an unintended consequence in many ways to entrench the power of the big tech that the EU is trying to fight through other policy tools such as uh, competition law. So in many ways, um, it is right that when the regulation is costly, and I mentioned sometimes that doesn't mean less innovation, but there is a distributional impact that we do need to be conscious of. And I think the EU was not fully aware of how this unintended consequence is really playing out on the global marketplace. I am optimistic, however, is that the EU is hearing the criticism, it cares about the criticism, and it's committed to trying to fix it. So already now when you follow the conversation about this landmark regulation that we all are eagerly awaiting, the Digital Services Act, that we expect to be unveiled in the end of December, early January, a big conversation has been that we do really need to make a distinction between the big powerful companies and the smaller companies. And it is not fair to expect the rules and the legal frameworks to be exactly the same vis-a-vis -vis both of them. So I hope that the biggest friends of the, the GDPR are also its most honest critics and will help the regulatory framework to evolve so that we can address any shortcomings such as the one that you mentioned. Okay. Thank you, Anu. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, my university has a campus in Madrid, and I can tell you that just to try to comply with this regulation has been extraordinarily time consuming and, and expensive. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very small operation. So I think it's part of the reason that I asked um, that question. Um, the questions are coming. One of them asks Can you please address the influence of the US dollar that still controls 60% of the world currency supply on the European Union and secondarily China? So uh, the question of US dollar, uh, Euro is not on par with the dollar. Euro was created often in order to do provide an alternative reserve currency and something that would give the EU the kind of financial uh, leverage and power uh, that the, um, the dollar creates. So the regulatory power that the Brussels Act captures follows a very different logic than when you, for instance, weaponizing finance or, uh, or um, deploying the power of your currency. And I think I am the first to concede that that is another type of power where the EU is not 
anywhere near as influential as the US is. The same goes when it comes to military power, for instance. And I think the, the, uh, the European Union knows it. And many of the weaknesses that were exposed with the design of the currency union with the last uh, uh, financial crisis, the euro crisis, luckily led to a path of reform that has made the euro area more resilient. The architecture that has been built after that means that the, the Europe, euro area is actually better able to now handle. It is still hard, but it's better able to face the, the financial mess and in the aftermath of COVID-19. So in many ways, the crisis will often make the EU's institutions and policies grow. They make them more resilient, but we're still a long way from uh, having the kind of uh, capital markets, for instance, sustained corresponding to the Euro uh, area that would be very necessary for the EU to be more powerful. China is a big question. So I think uh, we can probably address some different aspects of that. I mentioned uh, some elements of why I think the Beijing effect will not be a manifestation of how China will lead through regulatory power. There's a particularly particular aspect of Chinese power that I am uh, uh, very much aware and, and studying right now a lot. And that is, the, uh, that is Chinese regulatory power in the domain of digital economy. We certainly see China building, in addition to the Belt and Road Initiative, a digital Silk Road. And uh, it has been quite successful uh, uh, in, in advancing the Chinese approach to technology regulation through some international institutions such as the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. That follows a different logic than the Brussels effect, but it is influence and power nonetheless. China has also been powerful in exporting its standards through building the digital infrastructure in different corners of the world. So I am not at all underestimating the influence of China in certain domains, including the main domain that I just mentioned. I just think it follows the different logic and it's obviously powered by different set of values. It is the kind of digital authoritarianism that is being exported. So the the consequences, the implications, the stakes, and the logic of it is very different when we compare it to the Brussels effect. Thank you, Anu. Building up on, the, on, the, on your comments on China, I mean, it's clear that China is becoming more assertive and is starting to push um, to export standards in, in many areas, particularly uh, facial recognition. I mean, that's one that I think has raised a lot of concerns um, all over the world. Um, another example is the, the case of Huawei and the position of Huawei in the 5G market and, and its role in the, supply, in the supply chains. How should the European Union respond to those threats? I think that is very difficult and there hasn't been a cohesive European response. So if you think about, for instance, the national level decisions on whether to accept uh, Huawei to build the 5G infrastructure, we've seen quite disparate uh, uh, reactions across the European Union. But we certainly see the tide turning towards being more skeptical of the, the, the Chinese infrastructure. European Union has uh, ramped up and has uh, just this month uh, harmonized. Basically, there was a new, uh, uh, new legislation coming from the, the Commission and asking or calling for more harmonization when it comes to the national security review of foreign direct investment that the member states are undertaking. And often it is not just a, a regulation vis-a-vis -vis China, but one of the main drivers is the extent to which Chinese state-backed uh, acquisitions could be transforming the European market. And what are the various concerns when those acquisitions would involve some critical uh, uh, assets, technologies, parts of infrastructure. So we certainly see increasing skepticism increasing willingness to pursue regulation in order to better manage and contain the Chinese influence. Um, so um, I think it is a, uh, it, it's certainly a more geopolitically complex environment, um, heightened by trade wars, technology wars, and as you said, much more assertive uh, China. I think the EU, though, so compared to, for instance, going a little bit off the topic, but comparing the EU strategies on dealing with China more broadly, uh, compared to the US's strategies, the EU has not chosen 
to just relentlessly fight trade wars with its allies and enemies and everybody else alike. It has found some very productive ways to cooperate with Chinese when the interests have been aligned. So for instance, the EU and China and 15 other countries in the World Trade Organization just set up a temporary dispute settlement mechanism when the United States derailed and basically uh, made dysfunctional the existing dispute settlement mechanism by refusing to nominate members to the appellate body. So I think it is a, a strategically complicated calculus for the EU, but where the EU has been open on finding ways to collaborate with China when those interests can be aligned. Facial recognition, authoritarian surveillance, that is certainly not the easiest one to crack. Uh, uh, building on that, one of the questions that we have received is about the, 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 the foreign policy of the European Union. And specifically, how can the European Union check China on its territorial claim in South China Sea. And I guess the extension of the question, could, do, do you think that it's appropriate for, uh, for the European Union to use the Brussels effect as an instrument to leverage their foreign policy? So uh, the question is whether it would be appropriate and whether it even would be feasible and whether it would be wise. So first of all, it is very difficult to be a reluctant foreign policy power or military power. The EU has not shown any desire to be a leading uh, contender to decide the faith on battles in the South China Sea. It is not that this international environment would not implicate Europe, affect its core interests, but there has not been the kind of consolidation of the political will to build a regulatory capacity or the capacity that then were, sorry, to build a kind of foreign policy capacity that would match the regulatory capacity of the European Union. So it's very difficult to see the EU be very assertive without building that kind of capacity and without harnessing the political will that it's actually willing to pay the cost and take the risks. And, uh, and pursue the interest. And sometimes it's also less clear that the interests are so closely aligned across the 27 member states that the foreign policy, common foreign policy would easily emerge. It's one of the reasons why foreign policy is still subject to unanimity and uh, where we do uh, see um, sometimes probably less cohesive action than we would like to see the European Union to take. But I certainly, I am a big fan of articulating where Europe is powerful, but also the first one to concede that there are many critical areas where there is certainly nothing akin to the Brussels effect that will help the European Union, where the European Union needs to resort to diplomacy, cooperation with its allies and the power of persuasion um, and, and, and try to export its interests through these kind of political channels. And I think trying to mix geopolitics and geopoliticize a tool such as the Brussels effect, it's not necessarily wise. It can actually undermine an instrument that has served the European interests very well, in particular, because it has been a technocratic deployment of power that has proceeded largely underneath the radar of any political conflicts. And trying to escalate the regulatory issues um, and trying to use Brussels effect for the tools that it might be ill-suited for, I doubt that it's necessarily wise or effective. Okay, thank you, Anne. Just to remind our audience to please keep the questions coming in the Q&A. Um, there is a question the following. The European Union regulatory power depends on it using that power benevolently rather than for European companies' own advantage. As a result, it's really hard for the European Union to convert regulatory power into geopolitical or economic power, building up on what you just said. How does the European Union actually benefit from the Europe Brussels effect? And is there a risk that member states will undermine the Brussels effect in order to try and get more benefits for themselves? One of the examples from the person that asked the question is the desire of some member states to weaken competition law so that they can support national champions. Great, um, I, I love the question. I'm particularly concerned about this, this last part uh, where we do indeed see a shift in the discourse. So in my remarks, I mentioned how competition policy up until now has not been primarily at all, if at all, a tool for protectionism, but it's been driven by this desire to make the European 
markets more competitive and promote the interest and welfare of the consumer. But there is indeed now increasing pressures by member states such as France and Germany. And these were my remarks also when the UK is out of the negotiation table that we have more space for these kind of industrial policy driven demands to uh, dominate. And um, I think the question stems from this uh, recent decision by the European Commission to block a proposed merger in the rail sector between Siemens and Alstom that would have really created a European national champion, which would have been better able to potentially compete vis-a-vis -vis its Chinese counterparts. But the industrial policy was not driving the decision. The merger was blocked because it was considered to harm consumer welfare. So up until now, the Commission has stood firm and, and basically defending the non-politicized, the non-industrial policy-driven values that have been part of its competition uh, jurisprudence all these decades, and that I think has served Europe very well. So let me also respond to your first question as to how does the Brussels effect then concretely benefit European companies? So here is a very concrete economic benefit. So if the European Union can make sure that foreign companies follow the European rules when they compete in Europe, they can level the playing field and protect the competitiveness of the European industry. That will, be, that will not be at disadvantage in Europe. But if we see the Brussels effect basically export those European rules to the third markets outside of the EU as well, the EU can also level the playing fields and protect the competitiveness of the European companies when they are trying to compete against American firms on the American market, against the Brazilian firms on the Chinese market. So that is a very big economic reason that the EU benefits from the Brussels effect. Obviously, there are other benefits. If you think there can be benefits relating to more soft power and the idea that the EU genuinely, I believe, believes that these standards have made Europe a better place, that they have served Europe well, and that these standards would also serve the world better. And in some instances, let's say fighting the climate change, it is not enough to transform the way Europe uh, behaves. In order to protect Europe's interests, you also need to change the way the regulations and behavior of companies uh, take place in the global marketplace. So those are some examples where without any industrial policy, there are concrete ways that the Brussels effect as it is already benefits uh, the European interest. Thank you, Anu. Um, a lot of interest, as you can imagine, on the potential results in the, European, in the United States um, general election in just a couple of weeks. Um, one of the uh, participants, Philip Nossa, is asking, how will the European Union adjust to a possible Biden presidency? Do you think it will have any impact on um, the transatlantic relationship and or the Brussels effect? So um, uh, yes and no. I think it, it will and it will not have a major influence. So first of all, I think European Union is unambiguously, eagerly awaiting for a change in administration. This has been a hard ride for transatlantic cooperation and the current administration and European Union have not managed to find many issues where they would have worked together. There's been trade war. Um, there's been a, a, uh, the difficulty of working together on issues that the EU cares about, climate change, uh, the Trump administration walking away, uh, abandoning the Paris Climate Accord, saying basically that they walk away from World Health Organization, another institution that the European Union is committed to, cooperation uh, with the Iran nuclear deal. The list could go on and on. And that fundamental difference is that even though this talk has been a lot about European unilateralism, mm -hmm. Europe is also very committed to multilateralism. It's very comfortable and very effective in operating in a setting where it works with its allies, deploying its ability to effectively use the existing institutional frameworks. And this is something that the European Union is eager to get back to. And there is certainly an expectation that under the Biden administration, the US will rejoin the Paris Accord, US will rejoin the World Health Organization. We will not be seeing the transatlantic trade relations. We may not see a trade agreement, but we will not see the trade wars to dominate this important economic relationship. So there's many more paths towards 
if not normalization and going back to the kind of transatlantic relations they were at their best, I think there's going to be a long list of challenges for President Biden if he's elected. And the question is how salient are some of the issues that are important for the EU. But there certainly will be a communication and, and good faith attempts to try to negotiate common solutions. Whether it will actually impact the Brussels effect or not, in many ways, I describe the European Union as a contingent unilateralist that is willing to use unilateralism if there is no multilateral solution. So if there are more opportunities to cooperate multilaterally, we may see, relatively speaking, somewhat less of a vacuum that the Brussels effect needs to fill. But at the same time, this whole idea of the Brussels effect being the predominant global regulation is not going to change with the Biden coming in. The US has taken a backseat under democratic administrations as well as under Republican ones. So in many ways, the choice about how extensively you regulate the marketplace, it is not only a partisan question. The US lost that or willingly partially by choosing not to regulate since 1990s. And even under President Clinton or President Obama, we did not see the kind of regulatory push that would match the Brussels effect. So that's why I'm saying that we would see a change, a welcome change from the point of view of the EU, but we would not necess necessarily see a massive shift in who is the global regulatory hegemon. Thank you, Anu. There is a question from Grace Ballor and she asks, how can we historicize the European Union role as a global regulatory power. Was this role fundamental to the community's 1992 program and regulation of the internal market beginning in the 1980s? Or should we understand it as a more recent development, perhaps after the Treaty of Lisbon, which augmented regulatory capacity? Great, um, thank you. So I very much trace the, the origins of the Brussels effect where it really, it goes back in the, even the 60s when for instance, the EU started to regulate in domains like food safety and the EU has generated important standards. Some of those have been long time in the making. But I really would emphasize the one that you raised, the, the single European act and the decision to complete the single market through regulation. And that happens to coincide, like I mentioned, with the US pulling back. But um, I think it also, your, your remark um, highlights this importance, how the origins of the Brussels effect were not that the EU wanted to become a global regulatory power. It was an internally driven project to build a regulatory state that will integrate the common market. And this external effect, the Brussels effect was more of an afterthought it was inadvertent side effect. And often the EU in the beginning only really became aware of this external impact of the single market when its trading partners came to the EU and said, look, what you're doing is actually constraining our regulatory space and influencing the way our companies behave, not just in your market, but on our market as well. But at the same time, there's been a shift in about the last 10 years, since uh, 2010, you see a remarkable change in the way the commission, for instance, communicates about the goals of its uh, regulations of the single market. And up until then, we mainly saw references to the single market. But more recently, we have seen an increasing consciousness of this external impact that the single market has. And the EU was starting to make references to being the global standard setter, uh, uh, being the gold standard uh, that the rest of the world will follow. So we've seen now in parallel, not to replace, but basically have a second goal, more conscious external regulatory power goal to complement the still the, the, the strong internal market goal that can be traced really to the single European Act. Thank you very much. Um, one of the issues when I was reading the book that I thought it was um, fascinating, when you talk about the challenge when markets are what you call divisible, and when companies can maintain different standards in different markets, and for example, with a company that is producing in several countries, that they can keep the same European Union regulations throughout the European Union, but get away with different employment practices depending on the jurisdiction that they operate in. 
And one of the issues that I'm interested in um, is, for example, that the European Union has struggled to influence labor standards, um, even when they have tried to assign trade deals. And they have also struggled to um, export tax, their tax regimes, even within the European Union, and even in, imposing uh, taxes on tax companies, like it recently happened in the case of France. So how can the European Union address all this? Yeah, so I think you um, highlight the, the, the part of the theory that I think does the most analytical work in the Brussels effect. We haven't talked about it yet, but I mentioned how the Brussels effect emerges when the global companies conclude that they are better off following one standard as opposed to multiple regulatory regimes. So sometimes when the products or company conduct is divisible, they can take advantage of lower regulatory standards in different jurisdictions and produce different product varieties for different markets. That's when we don't see the Brussels effect. It's when the companies conclude that the products are non-divisible, either as a legal matter, economic matter, technical matter, often due to scale economies or the need to preserve a uniform branding that they choose to follow a single rule. But some issues, like you mentioned the labor rules, they are divisible in the sense that the company does not need to offer the European holidays for the American employees. Mm -hmm. They can have different policies. European Union cannot externalize that through the Brussels effect. So that's an example where the EU really resorts to um, trade agreements, international organizations, and its record is more mixed because it then would need to persuade the other governments to follow the regulatory preferences of the European Union. It's not where it can benefit the harness the self-interest of the companies and the logic of the market. So it is not, doesn't entail that Europe cannot do it, but it just basically needs to use different instruments of influence. I think the corporate taxation, that is another really interesting issue. There's this limited regulatory capacity that the EU has since member states still have a lot of power on taxation. Right now, the most critical issue is um, whether we can tax the digital companies. And it's a prime example where the individual member states such as France have moved forward and said, we are going to take the lead if there's no common European approach. But again, Europe has tried to prioritize a multilateral solution and wanted to pursue an agreement within an OECD. But thus far, it does not seem to be easily forthcoming. And if it does not uh, uh, come about in the OECD, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the EU do this uh, unilaterally. Thank you. There is a question from Elaine Papolia, the, the executive director of the Center for European Studies. Uh, she's thanking you for your analysis. And her question is um, a little bit off the central topic, but she's interested to understand something that um, we discussed briefly before. Your thoughts on the following. The European Union does exploit its formidable, its formidable trade power to pursue trade objectives. What are the challenges in translating this into actual political power and what might be viewed as legitimate influence. Again, something that you mentioned a little before, but, um, but again, how do we articulate this in a more effective way to, to become more of a central part of the European uh, common policy, foreign common policy? Yeah, so I think Europe has tried to develop more of a, a, a unified vo uh, voice in, uh, in foreign policy. So we now have a uh, president of the European Council we have a high representative. So we have made some strides in trying to consolidate uh, the foreign policy thinking um, and, and try to communicate more of a uniform approach. But I think it is still, we, we saw very recently, for instance, when the European Union tried to pursue sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Belarus, it was more contested than it should have been. If you think about how clearly the situation in Belarus was against the kind of fundamental interests and values that the European Union has but Cyprus was willing to veto that because of its own somewhat unrelated uh, interest uh, in the Mediterranean and the dealings with Turkey. So um, ultimately, this veto did not prevent the EU from condemning uh, the, uh, the Belarus uh, at the crushing of the dissent and the undemocratic result of the, the elections. Um, and the EU was able to have more of a common uh, policy. But again, going back to something that I said earlier, the EU has limits to the extent to which it wants to be a, a, a strong foreign policy power. 
we might need more of a unified voice given the complexity of uh, the global um, the, the sort of the foreign policy environment and the lack of leadership that we have had from uh, some of our allies like the United States. And I think many are frustrated with the inability of the EU to be more assertive. But um, I think it is more complicated. Again, it does not follow the kind of logic that makes the power much easier and less costly to use uh, like the Brussels effect. So it is one of those areas where the EU needs to work through diplomacy through a political consensus seeking mechanism. But then often when that consensus is harnessed and the EU can move in the eyes of the European governments and the EU citizens, those decisions are also more legitimate, which is one of the reasons then why we have not relaxed the requirement for unanimity when it comes to foreign policy making. Thank you. Uh, a couple of minutes left and um, one question that I have. Um, Related to the comment that you made, but also that you address in the book about the internal threats to the Brussels effect and the increasing skepticism and anti-European Union sentiment within the European Union. Um, and one of the manifestations of that, of course, is the, um, the, the increasing support for populist parties and, and populism in general. I wonder, in light of what is happening now with the COVID-19 crisis, has your view about this threat changed at all? Do you think that um, it's going to get better or worse? So uh, I don't think we can point to many victories of the populist, populist leaders in handling the pandemic well. So in many ways, it has not really strengthened any of these populist parties. In many ways, it has brought ultimately Europe more together. And I, I would not be surprised. The beginning wasn't, wasn't pretty. And partially because there was a very uncoordinated response and ineffective response because the EU does not have powers in public health. But I would not be surprised if after COVID-19, the member states will conclude that if anything, the pandemic taught us that it does not respect national borders and we need more Europe in order to better uh, uh, respond to a pandemic like this one. So that would be a, a, a definitely against the vision of these populist leaders that would want to see the dilution of the power uh, of Brussels. Um, but like, like I mentioned earlier, these populist parties have eroded confidence in, in some of the processes in the EU. Um, they threaten the fundamental values that still binds the Europeans together. And that is the key to the ethos of, of uh, what European Union stands for and, and who it is. But they have not really managed to rein in the regulatory power of Brussels. And, and I doubt that will necessarily happen easily because most of the, unlike the foreign policy that we just discussed, the single market and the relevant regulation does not require unanimity. You don't need to worry about the veto by Hungary or Poland saying that they are going to now withhold their support for some environmental regulation in order to extract a free pass on some of the rule of uh, law issues. So in many ways, you would need to have the populist parties to take over enough of the governments that we could not reach qualified majority. Of course, if we have in the European Parliament more populist parties, well, they did not take over the European Parliament in the last election. Mm -hmm. So we could move towards a situation where we have more collateral damage and everything that is pro-European becomes outvoted. But I think we're still not close to that being the threat. And that is not to say that I wouldn't worry about the populist parties. Uh, that's not to say that they don't pose a problem and a threat to European values. But I don't see a direct threatening condition between them and the EU's global regulatory power. Okay, so ending up on that positive note, um, I want to thank you, Professor Bradford, so much for your um, presentation and for this very interesting and stimulating discussion, and thank all the participants for the questions and for taking part on, on this event. Uh, wishing everyone um, well, please, please stay safe. And we hope that in the near future, we will be able to be back on campus and, and welcome you again to your alma mater. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.